William Tyndale was born in England in 1494. He lived during the time of the Reformation. And due to persecution, he eventually fled to Germany. Whilst living in Germany, Tyndale translated the New Testament into English. This monumentous achievement was condoned by, well, it was really condemned, sorry, condemned by Cardinal Wolsey, who declared William Tyndale a heretic. Much of William Tyndale's work translated its way into the King James Version of our Bibles, which the ESV and the NASB also are based on. He's had an enormous impact on the church today through translating the original from the Greek into English. He died so that that could happen. We need to thank the Lord for men like William Tyndale, who labored in the midst of much persecution so that we can have our Bible in English. This morning, I'd like to take a look at perhaps the most popular book in all of Scripture, a book that probably you and I visit more frequently than any other book in Scripture, the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms has been central to the spiritual life of God's people, really pertaining to their worship, informing their worship for over 3,000 years. It informs our worship, it sanctifies our lives, it comforts our souls, and most of all, it magnifies our Savior. Martin Luther referred to this book as a little Bible where everything contained in the entire Bible is beautifully and briefly understood. Jim George said that if you need a guide in your ongoing relationship with God, read the Psalms. The late R.C. Sproul said, Whenever I read the Psalms, I feel like I am eavesdropping on a saint, communing with the living God, having a conversation with the living God. We love the Psalms, because our hearts yearn for that intimate relationship that Adam and Eve had with God. Do you want to know God? Meditate on His Word. Do you want to commune with the living God? Spend much time in the book of Psalms. In order to get the most out of this book, it's very important that you understand the historical context, that you understand the arrangement that you understand the authorial intent. The book of Psalms is made up of 150 psalms. The name Psalms comes from the Hebrew word tahila, which means praise. And we see that in, it's really the very first word of Psalm 145, verse 1, tahila, praise. This is a book of praises, book of psalms. The earliest psalm was written by Moses, In 1400 B.C., the most recent psalm was written in 450 B.C. So that's really just before the intertestamental period. And if you think about it, that covers a period of time of a thousand years. It took a thousand years to to write these 150 psalms that we have in our Bibles, which is the primary book used for worship. It has informed God's people, the worship of God's people, for over 3,000 years. If you've read the book of Psalms, you will know that the 150 Psalms are divided up into five books. And every single book ends with the phrase, Blessed be Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Psalm 41, Psalm 72, 89, 106. And Psalm 150, blessed be Yahweh, praise Yahweh. This morning, I'd like us to immerse ourselves in Psalm 1. So if you haven't turned there already, please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 and 2 are are really pillars of this great archway through which we enter the book of Psalms. They are two foundational pillars. They they communicate the two major themes throughout the Psalter. Psalm 1, we see an emphasis on the Word of God. And in Psalm 2, we see an emphasis in the Son of God, the King. 
And it's really these two psalms which are a, a fitting introduction to the rest of the Psalter. Psalm 1 begins by declaring a blessing. Psalm 2 ends with declaring a blessing. And something with, with Hebrew grammar, you call that an inclu- inclusio, like a, a bracket. Whereas Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 should be taken as one unit, as one introductory unit introducing us to this marvelous Psalter. Psalm 1 commands us to love and cherish and obey the Word of God. Psalm 2 encourages us to love and cherish and obey the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Let's read Psalm 1 together. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For Yahweh knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Those who are devoted to God's word will be blessed. Those who reject God's word will be cursed, will perish. We see here those that are part of God's family and those that are not. Those who walk in accordance with God's truth, obeying God's truth, versus those that live in the way that they see fit, living in whatever way they see is right in their own eyes, in their own understanding. Two contrasting people, the blessed man and the cursed man. In Psalm 1, we see a description, really five characteristics of a blessed Christian. Psalm 1, we see five characteristics of a blessed Christian. The first three are stated in the negative, whereas the fourth is stated in the positive. And the fourth is certainly the climax of the psalm. The first characteristic of a blessed Christian is the Christian's counsel. The Christian's counsel, verse 1. Look at the beginning there of verse 1. The blessed Christian does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The blessed man doesn't walk according to the counsel of the wicked. The Hebrew word for walk really relates to one's behavior, one's direction, one's path. In other words, the general pattern of one's life. He doesn't seek the wisdom from the world. He's not thrown by or influenced by opposing views that are prevalent in our world system. He's not swayed by every opinion, every wind of doctrine, but he is firmly rooted in the Word of God. The psalmist addresses both the mind and the body. Firstly, one's thinking, influenced by the counsel that he or she receives. And then, Body, acting, acting in accordance with that counsel. The blessed man does not receive wicked counsel and live in wickedness. Who are the wicked? Well, the psalmists refer to them 82 times in the Psalter. Here at the end of Psalm 1, the wicked are those who will not stand in the judgment. They will perish. In Psalm 3 verse 7, God breaks the teeth of the wicked. In Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked will return to Sheol. In Psalm 11, verse 6, the Lord rains coal on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be their portion, the portion of their cup. In Psalm 31, verse 17, the wicked are put to shame. In Psalm 37, verse 17 again, the arms of the wicked will be broken. The wicked will be cut off. The wicked are proud. The wicked trust in their own wisdom. 
They don't walk in accordance with God's wisdom as revealed in His Word. They live as if God doesn't exist. But the blessed man or woman is not so. We look to God's Word for counsel. When we face the many decisions that life causes us to make, who to get married to, what work we will do, how we will raise our children, how we will use our finances, how we will spend our time. Do you look to His Word to guide you with those very important decisions? Or are you looking to the world? The blessed man looks to God's Word because God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. James says that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. Ask God, who gives generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. The wisdom that is found from God is found in His Word. Does looking to God's Word for wisdom characterize your decision-making? In your decision-making process, do you first and foremost start with God's Word to see what God has to say? Or do you first go and make your plans, implement your decisions, and then pray that God will bless them? Even as believers, we can be deceived by the sinfulness of our own hearts. Therefore, before making any significant decisions and plans, we should ask ourselves, what does God's Word have to say about this matter? Am I in any way, are these plans in any way prohibited by God? Recently, I encouraged a man who was separated from his wife to go be reconciled with her. His response was, God told me not to return to her. What? This man has failed the first step in seeking God's will. Looking to God's word, not to some mystical voice. God's word is so clear about reconciliation, forgiveness, divorce. Another question you need to ask yourself is, will this plan enhance or detract me? from my ability to serve the Lord? Will it strengthen or will it weaken my walk with Him? Whilst God's Word doesn't directly address every issue that we face, there are commands, there are implications, there are principles which speak to every decision that we need to make. It is absolutely sufficient for all things pertaining to life and godliness. But just a cautionary note, if we are so intent on doing what we want to do, then there is a danger in reading into Scripture what we want to be read, what we wanted to say, mishandling God's Word. Therefore, it is very important that you seek godly counsel from Christians who are well grounded in the truth, Christians who would either affirm or even challenge your decisions. Secondly, the Christian's company. The Christian's company. Take a look at the the middle of verse 1. The second characteristic of a blessed Christian is that he does not stand in the way of sinners. He does not stand in the way of sinners. Now, I want you to notice the progression here from walking to standing. Walking implies a continual movement, non-stop. Standing indicates this momentary pause. The blessed man doesn't stop and consider the lives of the wicked around him. The blessed man doesn't halt like a horse to consider the way of sinners. Obviously, the longer the pause, the stronger the temptation to give ourselves to such a way. The worldly temptations usually appeal to our flesh. They appeal to our selfish desires for comfort, control, the approval of man, or boosting our ego. They are often strong desires which we need to resist with great difficulty. And it will require us to deny ourselves. It will require us to consider the needs of others as more significant than ourselves. It will require us to love others more than we love ourselves. Like Joseph, who refused to stand in the way of sinners when he fled from the temptation that Potiphar's wife brought him, 
We need to flee temptation. We mustn't even stand, even for, for a moment, in the face of temptation. You know, just as well as I, that even though we might share many things in common with non-Christians, such as hobbies or jobs, but the most important aspect of your life, your faith, is generally a no-go area. If you go there, it's either met with a condescending smile or outright disdain. Sometimes it invokes a snide remark which is very often very offensive to God and Christ, whom we love so dearly. As Paul said to the Corinthians, what fellowship does light have with darkness? We are in the world, therefore, yes, indeed, we will interact with unbelievers, and we should. But the majority of our time should be spent in the company of believers those that will encourage us in God's truth. Because if the majority of our time is spent in the world intermingling with non-Christians, it will only be a matter of time until their philosophies and the empty deceit of the world begins to shape our thinking and worse, impact our lives. Paul again warned the Corinthians, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should be like some of the monks who withdrew from society and go and hide up in some mountain. No. God has intentionally left us in this world. Even though we are not of this world, we are still left in this world. And Christ has prayed that we would not be led astray by the evil one. He is praying for us this very moment as we live within this world. But we are to live as lights in this world. The primary focus of our interaction with unbelievers ought to be the proclamation of the gospel, the good news of salvation, man's only hope of salvation. And we need to guard our time to ensure that it doesn't replace the time that we spend with fellow believers who will build us up in the faith, who will sharpen us and encourage us. Blessed Christians seek counsel from God's word rather than man. They choose their company very carefully. And thirdly, they are cautious of the conversations that they have. They are cautious of the conversations that they have. We've considered the Christian's counsel, his company. Now let's consider his conversations. The third is the Christian's conversations. Take a look there at the end of verse 1. The third characteristic of a blessed Christian is is he does not sit in the seat of scoffers. He does not sit in the seat of scoffers. He doesn't spend an extended time having conversations with unbelievers. Proverbs describes the scoffer as one who is arrogant, one who loves conflict, and most importantly, one who vociferously rejects wisdom and rejects correction. To sit is to dwell in, it's to remain in, to converse with, to enjoy the wicked and their perverse conversations. This implies being comfortable in the company of the wicked, spending time with them, ongoing conversations, talking about the world and that which is really of a worldly perspective. Firstly, as Christians who affirm and believe in and hold dear to the sovereignty of God, our perspective of the world is vastly different. Secondly, those conversations are simply unhelpful. They are bad stewardship of the time that God has entrusted to us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are in spiritual war. We are to engage in warfare. We are to work for the kingdom of God. We cannot sit in the seat of scoffers. Be careful about who you gather with. It is far more dangerous to gather with a scoffer than into in a room full of COVID positive individuals. But your priority should rather be to spend much time with those who will encourage you in the faith, build you up in the faith, those who will speak the truth of God to you in love, those who will teach you and admonish you 
in all wisdom. Don't miss this downward spiral from walking to standing to sitting. And the the process here is a very natural progression. And it often happens without us even realizing it. We are oblivious to this decline. Be aware. Be warned. Fourthly, the Christian's commitment. The Christian's commitment. Unlike the previous three characteristics of the blessed Christian, which were stated in the negative, this one is stated in the positive. Christians don't walk in the way of the wicked. They don't seek counsel from the wicked. They don't stand in the way of sinners. They don't participate in the activities of, the sin- of, of sinners. And Christians don't sit, dwell with scoffers. But instead, Christians feast on God's word. Take a look there at verse 2. The fourth characteristic of a blessed Christian is his delight is in the law of Yahweh. And on his law he meditates day and night. Contrary to false religious practices which strive to empty one's mind, Christians strive to fill our minds. We want to fill our minds with truth. We want to meditate on God's word. To meditate is to ponder. It's to give serious thought to the words, the grammar, the historical context, the literary context. To seek to understand every word provided, written in God's holy word. To meditate is to murmur. It's, it's the act of muttering or whispering God's word to, to oneself throughout the day. Musing, pondering, contemplating, thinking upon The word of God characterizes this deep, reflective thought, which is often carried out repetitively throughout the day. The blessed man reads God's word. He memorizes God's word. He sings God's word. He preaches God's word to himself, especially in the face of temptation. And he fills his mind with truth, which will inform his thoughts, which will direct his speech and his actions. How often do we as Christians meditate upon God's word? Day and night. When we rise and when we go to bed and throughout the day. If you've spent any amount of time in the book of Psalms, you will know that it is filled with theology. And it reflects David's deep and real relationship with God. Often, many of the Psalms that he has written, he quotes prior revelation. He knows God's truth. It is in him and it comes out of him. David knew and he loved God and he was immense in his word. And really there's no other way to know God but through his word, but through the means by which he has revealed himself to us and that is through his inscripturated word. Not through philosophy, not by our own imagination, But God has revealed his character, his perfections, his attributes to us in the pages of Scripture, from Genesis through to Revelation. As one writer explains, the Scriptures are our only reliable source of knowledge about who God is, what he is like, what his will is, what his plans and purposes are, what he has done in the past, what he will do in the future, who we are, what life is all about, how we can know, love and serve him. What are the many promises He gives us and how we can fulfill His purposes in this world? In His high priestly prayer, Jesus prayed that we would have eternal life. And He described what this eternal life is. Eternal life is knowing Him, God, and Jesus Christ whom He sent. And the Greek word for know is gnosko. And in this context, it means experiential knowledge, not simply intellect, not simply understanding facts about Scripture, facts about God and Christ, but it's, it's relationship, it's communion, it's intimacy, knowing God as He has revealed Himself to us in the pages of Scripture, obeying Him, loving Him, and having a life that has been transformed by Him through the ministry of His Word. Fellow believer, Do the words of Paul echo the desires of your heart to know Christ? Where he said to the church in Philippi 
that I might know Him and the power of His resurrection, that I might share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. We love God's Word because we love God. And His Word is the instrument through which the Holy Spirit uses to help us obey Him, to transform us into His image. As the psalmists have said, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The extent to which we know victory over sin will be largely determined by how much time we spend seeking God in His word, seeking Him in prayer. Jesus in His humanity knew Scripture. And what did He do in the face of temptation? He quoted Scripture. Jesus had a greater pleasure, a greater joy and satisfaction in the Word of God than He did in the fleeting pleasures of this world. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. After describing how God has revealed Himself to us through creation, David goes on to explain how He has revealed Himself to us through his word, from verse 7 onwards. In verse 7 he says, The law of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul. See, the word of God shows us that we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. And it shows us how we can be restored to him through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. He continues, The testimony of Yahweh is sure making wise the simple. The Word of God makes the young, the immature, wise, enabling them to counter the lies of Satan and this world. Verse 8, The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. You see, when one lives in rebellion against God, one experiences insecurity. One experiences sadness and pain. But obedience to God's Word brings joy to one's heart. Satisfaction. It was more satisfying for Christ to know and enjoy Scripture than to embrace the temptations of this world. He continues, The commandment of, the commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's Word gives us understanding. It gives us spiritual understanding. Verse 9, The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your spirit warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. No wonder the psalmists loved loved God's word. In his letter to the Romans, Paul echoes similar thoughts says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, which he describes as good, pleasing, and perfect. Much like David. The thing is, in our fast-paced, task-orientated culture in which we live, we need to purposefully and deliberately slow down when it comes to the time that we spend in God's Word, when it comes to communing with the living God as we read the pages of Scripture. Deliberately slow down. Ponder each word. Understand the grammar. Understand the context. And worship the Lord in response to what you read. Don't let your Bible reading just be a task list to tick off your ever-increasing to-do list. We need to approach God with humility to commune with Him in His Word. This is how we know Him. This is how we enjoy Him and feast on Him. We need to read Scripture and reread it. We need to memorize it, sing it, pray it. Talk to God with your eyes open and your Bibles before you. Let the Scriptures inform your prayers. And plead with Him to help you understand it and obey it. Turn back to Psalm 1. Psalm 1 verse 3 The psalmist continues and he says that this blessed man, the blessed Christian, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. 
in all that he does, he prospers. Christians who delight in the word of God, who meditate upon it day and night, they are Christians that are flourishing. Christians that are fruitful, bearing fruit 50, 60, 80, 100 fold. The tree, of course, is an illustration. It's representative of the blessed Christian. The streams of of water are representative of the law of Yahweh, the word of God. If you are firmly rooted and grounded in the word of God, you will consistently bear fruit. You will flourish. You will prosper. This is true prosperity. Psalm 92 says that the righteous flourish like the palm tree, and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Cedar was a very strong tree. They are planted in the house of Yahweh. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. Irrespective of your age, irrespective of how long you have been walking with the Lord, this is true. If you meditate and obey the word of God, you will bear fruit in abundance. You will flourish in your Christian walk. What is this fruit? Well, really it's the fruit of a transformed life. And Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, in Galatians 5 verse 22 onwards, he tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And these are the qualities that we as Christians will bear in increasing measure as we meditate upon Scripture, as we commune with the living God, as the Holy Spirit takes His Word and transforms us into the image of Christ. Not only will the blessed man yield fruit in season, but verse 3 says that his leaf will not wither. The Christian who is regularly nourished by the Word of God will not wither in times of difficulty, times of trial. Jeremiah says that the man who trusts God is like a tree planted by water, who sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaf remains green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Fellow believer, Is this a picture of you in the face of trials? Do you still continue to bear fruit in abundance because you are connected to the streams of living water? You are engulfed in the Word of God, submerged, immersed in the truth pertained therein. If not, where are you seeking your counsel? Is it from the Word of God? Or is it from the world? What company are you keeping? Are you sitting with scoffers? Or are you sitting with the family of God? How much time are you spending in God's word? Are you meditating upon it day and night? Since getting to know you, many of you, after having arrived here in August, after having spent four years studying in the States, I've been so encouraged by all that the Lord has been doing in you and through you. And one of the many examples was the response to the newsletter that went out at the end of last year, where we encouraged you to read the Bible through this year, to read it through during 2021. We encouraged you to maintain a vibrant prayer life. Seventeen of you are on the five-day reading plan, which means that by the end of the year, you would have read through the Bible once. Six of you are on the Robert McShane reading plan which means that you're going to read the New Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs twice, and the Old Testament once. Three of you are on the Grant Horner's reading plan, which means you're reading the Bible three times this year. And then five of you are on your own personal plan. I assume it's probably reading the Bible through once a month. (laughs) Nevertheless, I am so looking forward to standing here in a year's time and seeing the ministry of the Word, seeing all that God has done through His Word in all of our lives. He will transform us. We will bear fruit in keeping with our salvation. Verse 4 says that in all that He does, He prospers. Now, of course, this is not a blank check 
This isn't a blanket statement promising unlimited prosperity, unlimited success. Remember, context is king. Within the context, it's those who meditate on the Word of God, who live in obedience to the Word of God, that experience true prosperity. God said to Isaiah, This is the one to whom I look. He who is humble and contrite and trembles at my word. If we have that mindset as we approach God, spending time in His word, we invite the face of God. We invite the presence of God in our life. That is true prosperity. That is true success. Sin brings calamity both for the sinner and those around him. You'll remember when David committed sin with Bathsheba and then murdered? He was judged. He lost four children, and God said that the sword will never depart from his, his house. And you'll remember that when, when he was in his pride, he counted his army. What did God do? He killed 70,000 Israelites. Were they at fault? No. David was. But our sin doesn't only impact us. It impacts those around us. Our sin is not just contained to our bedroom, to our house. It impacts everyone around us. But when we spend time in the Word of God, we are transformed. We grow in increasing victory over sin, which fuels our joy, strengthens our faith, increases our hope, secures our assurance, and most of all, it glorifies our God. This is the prosperous life. This is true success. But this is not the case for the wicked. In contrast to the fruitful Christian, the psalmist says in verse 4, The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now again, he portrays this graphic picture of the worthless life of the wicked. This worthless husks of grain that were removed by tossing the grain into the air and the wind would blow off the chaff, and the good seed would then fall to the ground, the wheat that they would use, separating the husks from the grain. Even though unbelievers might appear to be good people, and they might do many good things, they have no desire to please God. They have no desire to obey God's word. And as a result, all that they produce will amount to nothing. John the Baptist said in Matthew 3 verse 12, that Jesus will, with his winnowing fork in his hand, he will clear his threshing floor. He'll gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Just as the chaff is separated from the wheat, the wicked will be separated from the righteous. And that is why the psalmist says in verse 5, that the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. On the final day, the righteous will stand before God, but the wicked will not be there. The wicked will be cast into the lake of fire, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth day in and day out without fail for all eternity. But there is salvation in one name, Jesus Christ, the living stone. According to the predetermined will of God, Jesus came to earth as both man and God. Truly God and truly man. Jesus is truly God. He created the universe and He sustains the universe by the word of His power. He holds all things together, Colossians 1.16. He entered this world and whilst He was being sustained by the nutrients within Mary's womb, He was upholding the universe, sustaining Mary, giving her life, giving her breath. He is truly God, but He's also truly man. And in great humility, He grew up in, this, in the pains of this fallen world, though He Himself never sinned. He lived a sinless life, a life that both you and I have failed to live. Jesus lived perfectly. He was tempted just as we were, yet He never sinned. And in obedience to God and on behalf of God's people, He fulfilled all righteousness. He fulfilled the law's demands for us. And as a demonstration of God's love, He died to pay sin's penalty in full, to absorb the wrath of God in the place of sinners, so that we could be forgiven, that we could be saved. And on the third day, 
He rose. He rose from the grave and He is alive today interceding for His own. Please, turn from your sin and turn to Christ. Believe in Him. Repent of all that dishonors God. Cry out to Yahweh for mercy and He will save you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Plead with Him to graciously make you alive spiritually for His glory, that you might know the joy of salvation. We have considered the Christian's conduct. We've considered the Christian's company. We've considered the Christian's conversations. We've also considered the Christian's commitment. Now, fifth and finally, let's consider the Christian's conclusion. The Christian's conclusion. Verse 6 states that Yahweh knows them. He knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We know the Lord, and He knows us. What is eternal life? Knowing God and Jesus Christ whom He sends. For all eternity, Christians will enjoy unhindered fellowship with Yahweh. Our faith will be made sight. We will see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ because of His redeeming grace, His mercy towards us and deserving sinners. That day is coming. But Luke 13 verse 27 says that Jesus will say to the wicked at the final judgment, I do not know you. But to the righteous... Jesus will say, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and they know me. The wicked and all that they have done will perish. But the righteous, along with all that they have accomplished for the Lord, will remain forever. This is the work of the word, the ministry of the word, empowered by the Spirit, which transforms us into the image of Christ. If you do not know Christ, I invite you today, I implore you, I plead with you, please embrace Him. Flee from your sin and trust in the finished person, finished work and person of Jesus Christ. Be saved. Fellow believer, in order to experience a blessed Christian life, to know Christ more deeply, to live for Him more consistently, We need to spend much time in God's Word. Much time in the book of Psalms. We need to give careful thought to our counsel, our company, our conversations, our commitment, and our conclusion. Most of all, submerge your lives with the truth of God's Word. Whilst translating the Greek New Testament into English, William Tyndale faced much opposition He worked under the most hostile, the most adverse of conditions, pursued by secret agents, police raids, betrayal by friends, loss of manuscripts. And what made matters even worse is that in 1530, Tyndale publicly criticized King Henry VIII for his unbiblical divorce, which resulted in the king demanding for his arrest by the German authorities. Five years later, in 1535, he was arrested and imprisoned at Brussels. And during his imprisonment, which lasted a year and a half, he led many to the Lord, his prison keeper, the keeper's daughter, and others of his household. And then on the 8th of October, 1536, at the town of Vilvoort, Tyndale was brought out to be executed. He was strangled by the hangman and then tied to a stake where he was set alight, burned by fire. And as Tyndale burned, with a fervent zeal and a loud cry, he cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. His enemies had said that his translation was heresy. But as he wrote to John Frith, 
He says, I call God to record against the day we shall appear before our Lord Jesus that I never altered one syllable of God's word against my conscience. Nor would I this day if all that is in the earth, whether it be honor, pleasure, or riches, might be given to me. May that be our testimony. His enemies tried to silence him, but two years after his death, God answered Tyndale's prayer. King Henry VIII ordered that the, the Bible of Miles Coverdale be used in every parish. The Coverdale Bible was largely based upon Tyndale's translation. And then in 1539, Tyndale's own edition of the Bible was officially approved for printing. Tyndale's translation has inspired the works of the Great Bible of 1539, the Geneva Bible of 1560, the Bishop's Bible of 1568, the King James Version of 1611. Many of our modern translations, the ESV, the NASB, have been inspired by the Tyndale Bible, the Tyndale translation from Greek to English. We can thank God for men like William Tyndale, who died so that we can have the scriptures in English today. We need more Tyndales who love God's word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for William Tyndale and the many men that went after him who died so that we could have the Bible today in English. We thank you so much for your holy word which is true and perfect and right and good and altogether lovely and beautiful because it is an accurate representation of you, your beautiful character. Lord, you are exalted through, the, through the, the pages of Scripture. Lord, your power is displayed through the ministry of the Word as you save those who were once spiritually dead, making them alive together with Christ. As you transform those that were once enslaved to sin, struggling with various sins and passions, transforming them more and more into the image of Christ, giving them increased victory as you sanctify them as they live a prosperous life because of the ministry of your word. Thank you so much. Help us as a people, as Livingstone Bible Church, to love your word and to obey your word. Please continue to magnify Christ through your word, we pray. Amen.